But without further ado, let's introduce our speaker tonight, um, Melissa Withers. Thank you. Um, Thank you. She's a managing director of, uh, of RevUp uh, by BetaSpring, where she runs accelerator operations. They have a very innovative model uh, for accelerator that we're going to be talking about a little bit more in, in detail. Uh, her priority is harnessing the power of BetaSpring's mentor network to help portfolio companies uh, win and grow. Her career began at Whitehead, Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research at MIT with a unique gig working communications for the Human Genome Project. Uh, and she's, she was also executive director of the Business Innovation Factory, a leader in the design and testing of new and disruptive business models. And um, as a mentor, her skills are in PR, customer experience design, customer discovery, and get to market communications, and many more things that we'll talk about. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, so it's customary for uh, Startup Grind, Fireside Chats, to start with a little bit about your background, uh, where you grew up. Uh, how you got started entrepreneurship and the first thing that got you motivated to work in 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 developing your own your own business okay uh, you all should have had coffee instead of beer uh, because my life experience uh, is not that exciting um, I actually started just down the block uh, in life sciences at Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research and it was there that I sort of caught the startup bug it's a really long time ago now probably almost uh, almost 20 years we'll say 15 and back at that time there was a convergence happening in technology uh, both in the turns out in life sciences and across technology where things were getting cheaper and faster and more dynamic and at the time uh, you would you, today you wouldn't really think of basic research as being very entrepreneurial but at the time I was working with a researcher uh, named Eric Lander who was working on the public sequencing of the human genome project and he was in a race with a guy named Craig Ventner at Solera Genomics to be the first to finish the sequence so that the private sector wouldn't uh, patent the genome and make it impossible for the public sector to use that information for basic research and so to do this we started building machines so that we could go faster and faster and faster and started breaking all the rules uh, that that constrain traditional basic science. Uh, so in many ways, that experience, while not anywhere related to the kinds of companies now that we work with at Betaspring, I think was where I caught the entrepreneurial bug. Um, I spent some time in the public sector in between there and then started a company uh, that uh, focused on uh, business model innovation. It was my way to take my love of systems biology. I was a failed bench researcher, by the way. I had a lot of accidents, uh, fires, uh, toxic acids, um, bad data, uh, and I was uh, essentially told by an incredible mentor to quit science. Um, yeah, totally. Uh, but it turns out I had a love of the language of science, and at the time I was able to find a, a graduate degree program at Northeastern, uh, which was all about science communications, and that's how I started um, my path. Uh, then after uh, leaving my first startup to do a little tour of duty in the public sector as a communications director for a newly elected mayor, I then had the opportunity to learn that I also sucked at politics. Um, <laughs> And right around that time, about six years ago, uh, my friends had uh, created BetaSpring, which was one of the first startup accelerators in the world. And they had often said very glibly over drinks that if I ever wanted to come work for them, I could. And so at 9 a.m. on a Friday morning, as my political career went up in flames, I called them and said, remember that time you said I could come work for you? And they said, yes. I said, how about today at noon? Because um, I didn't want to put out the press release that said I was leaving public service to go back to the private sector, you know, with like the air quotes around it. Uh, so they, uh, within a, an hour or two, decided that it would be perfectly appropriate for me to join the organization. Uh, that was six years ago. Um, and that's the origin myth of Betaspring. Um, but Betaspring itself has also had quite a bit of evolution over the years. Sorry, I don't want to hold this anymore. I'm going to stick it somewhere. Is that good enough? Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. So, so let's talk a little bit about how you started it at, at Better Spring. What sure. was your role and what was the team like? What, 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 where was it the company? Yeah. So Startup Acceleration, we talk about it now like it's been around for a million years, um, but it's actually only a decade old phenomena. And I think it's really important to stop and pause to understand what that means. So in 2009, when Better Spring was started, it was the eighth accelerator in the world. How many startup accelerators are there now? There are hundreds, literally hundreds, um, thousands if you count those that have opened across the world. So when we started in 2009, the model was very new. It was created here in Cambridge by a guy named Paul Graham, had a 
a, a genius, amazing guy. Like I, he is like the like the godfather of entrepreneurship. He had an idea one year, and he said, "Hey, I'm going to do this thing called the Startup Accelerator, and I'm going to work with early stage companies. I'm going to give them twenty thousand dollars. I'm going to take six percent common stock, and then um, uh, we're going to use mentors to help them grow." Right? Sounds really great. Do you know how he came up with that? He decided that uh, he realized that three months, that's how long the Startup Accelerator was going to last. Why do you think he picked three months? Summer. That's how much time the students at MIT had off in the summer. Uh, why do you think he picked $20,000? Rent for students for that summer. Yes, rent and ramen for three people to live in Cambridge for three months. Why do you think he picked 6% common stock? Sounded fair. <laughs> <laughs> so for perpetuity, People picked up that model and ran with it. Uh, Beta Spring was one of them. And as it turns out, it was a really good model in that it recognized that it was cheaper, easier, and faster for young founders, especially, or all age founders, in the case of the Beta Spring portfolio, to start companies. You no longer had to buy hardware. You could use cloud services, right? You didn't, there was literally a time for the young people in the audience, there was a time when the only way you could reach a customer was to call them or ring a doorbell. And then this thing called the internet happened. Mm -hmm. And it is impossible to underscore the power of that. And so Startup Accelerators really picked up on that um, and really ran with it. But now, fast forward to 2014, where Betaspring was once the eighth accelerator. There were now hundreds of accelerators, and all based on the same model, which was this equity-driven model where you found early stage ventures and you tried to guide them um, into an equity pathway that would lead towards an exit. Then you could get your money back and everybody would feel good. Um, and for us, it, uh, it has been an, that part of our life story was a very very good model. Portfolio, we did 89 companies that way, many of them uh, in, here in Boston. Uh, incredible experience working with amazing founders. Portfolios raised $65 million in follow-on funding, produced four exits. Uh, very, very proud. Um, but we had an opportunity in 2015 to pause and ask ourselves, was this what we wanted to do for the rest of our lives? Did we want to continue to be unicorn hunters with the other 2,000 accelerators that existed across the globe? And we decided no. And so we decided to embark on a new model in 2015. So, so what motivated that? The reason that you wanted to be to differentiate from others, or that you thought there would be a, a better model that yeah. brings. So, just really quickly, I'll tell you how we changed the model. In 2015, we moved away from focusing on unicorn hunting, looking for companies that would have outside eg outside exits, outsized exits, and began focusing on companies where revenue was the primary driver of growth, uh, looking for companies that had the potential to maybe grow to be really big, 50 million, 100 dollar, 100 million, 100 dollar, huh? 100 million dollar companies, but maybe not obvious upon inception that they were exit worthy. Uh, we we then used our investment model to mirror that, and we moved away from equity and started using a revenue royalty contract where we would recoup our investment over a 36-month period as a portion of revenue that the company was generating. And the reason why we did this was not because we were anti-equity, but because we started, we started to look back at our own portfolio. We saw a lot of blood on the tracks. We also saw that our favorite companies and the companies that were doing really well found revenue early. Um, and also, many of the founders that had found revenue early weren't that excited about driving towards an exit. They were really happy being operators of their company. Um, the other thing we noticed was that if you look at the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies, um, only 7% of those companies had taken venture financing. So more than 90% of the fastest growing companies in North America were growing their companies on something other than venture financing. So the reason we changed the model wasn't because we were anti-equity, but we realized we had a choice. We could continue to unicorn hunt with the other really amazing accelerators that were at the head of that snake, the Y Combinators and Techstars of the world, uh, or we could begin to work with a group of underserved companies that we felt had the potential to be big, make investors happy, but also have real impact in the world um, using a model that was a little more flexible. So do you think there's a cultural difference between the type of founder, the type, or is it the type of industries? Maybe there's industries that require, or is, is, what is the mix, or what are the type of companies that uh, are better suited for that model? So I think revenue is pretty universal across industries. Um, I, think, I think one thing that happened with the emergence of the accelerator model was the, uh, the sort of fabric of the startup narrative. Right? I'm going to get a little meta here. Um, we take for granted again today, sitting here in Boston, that we've been talking about startups like this for perpetuity. Um, 15 years ago, no one talked about startups. 
Really no one gave a shit about startups uh, at all. Everyone cared about enterprise. And then with the convergence of these, uh, these factors, it allowed startups to come into the market in very exciting and disruptive ways and really to grow quickly. For startups over the five year period to go from being unknown to being known. It was a huge shift. It's really hard, really, really hard to, uh, to overstate that. But the narrative of startups really got hooked on that unicorn story. And that became the sexy, fun story that dominated the narrative, right? Then you had TechCrunch, and you have all these other public publications. Did I just break that? All these other publications that were really focused on that. So I don't think it's so much that there's particular types of companies that are better suited for revenue-driven growth, as it is to say that there's a dominant narrative about startups that tends to focus on only a very small sliver of the startup ecosystem. So let's talk a little bit about, about how the, the rev up or the, the rev experience works. So what would an entrepreneur or founder expect to encounter if they apply and they become part of the team? Yeah, so we kept a lot of the old model. It took a long time to develop a good startup accelerator model and we retained the best of it from the past. So our program is still three months long. Uh, it turns out that's the right amount of time to be up in someone's grill. After about three months of being up in someone's grill every day, you sort of need a little bit of a break. So the 12-month period still seems to work really well. Um, it's still mentorship driven. We have an incredible network of mentors who are already made. They're not uh, vendors selling services to startups. These are people that have built successful companies. These are people who love to pay it forward. And they can help entrepreneurs essentially go further faster and most importantly, not fall into the holes they don't need to fall into. Uh, and w one change was we, the program is no longer residential in that it used to be that the 89 companies we did uh, between 2009 and 2014 had to literally move into our building and be with us. Um, our model now is less focused on geography and we split our time and we travel to our companies and our companies travel to us. Um, we, uh, we still invest cash, so we invest $75,000 in cash, and, but that's primarily uh, to focus on growth experiments, not to backfill technology debt or to help you repay yourself for the $75,000 that you didn't pay yourself last year. Uh, it's to make sure that the company has gas in the tank to fund revenue-driven experiments. And probably the biggest change is we added a full-time four-person growth team uh, that works for Betaspring. Uh, but then for each of our portfolio companies, when they come into the accelerator, that team becomes an extension of their team. And for the duration of the accelerator, they are there to help the companies uh, execute and design a series of customer acquisition experiments, to help them with their content marketing, to help them with their brand positioning, to help them with their metrics, with their analytics. Um, and that's something that an early stage venture just can't buy. And you don't pay for that. It's not like you have to take your $75,000 that I give you and then you pay it back to me uh, that way. Um, that $75,000 is there. So if that team wants to execute things that might cost money, you know, you'll have gas in the tank to do that. Or maybe you need to hire someone that's focused on growth, or maybe you need content, whatever it is that you need. Um, and then the difference is, is upon exit from the accelerator, we have no, we don't take any equity in your company. So we have a fiscal relationship that lasts for 36 months uh, where you will pay uh, back to us a percentage of your revenue over time. Um, but you will still become part of the Betaspring alumni network and be included in the roster of 89 companies that we did prior to RevUp. Great, so, so let's talk about- Oh, and me. You will spend a lot of time with me. <laughs> That's a and huge perk. And my partner, Alan, yeah, because who wouldn't want to do that? <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about some of those components. Can you describe what is a shared growth team? What does that look like and what sure. do they do? So the growth team are uh, full-time employees of Betaspring, and they are available to our portfolio companies to to be an extension of your capability. So depending on what you need. So the program's really customized. So we just made an investment in Boston uh, last week. Uh, we met with that company. Uh, we meet with the companies each week, um, in this case here in Boston. The growth team is there uh, to execute on activities that maybe you just don't have capacity to do. So one of the activities the growth team did uh, for this particular company was they did a comprehensive evaluation and review of that, of all of the analytics, metrics, uh, web traffic, customer acquisition costs, Facebook, social, all that, and presented that to the team in a way that really the team didn't wasn't able to see it for themselves because they'd been in the weeds for a really long time. Uh, the growth team uh, spent a year training with us um, on real companies. Uh, they're also expert in a lot of growth hacking uh, tools, the, their full stack, everything from uh, analytics all the way up to content. Um, and so it's essentially your, it's like having four more people working for you that you didn't have yesterday. 
And you also mentioned uh, things like uh, helping the, uh, develop or understand the, their optimal sales channels. Can you talk a little bit about that besides um, the normal things that uh, you would expect uh, in terms of mentorship? Uh, does it have a particular, particular thing that is very keen to growth yeah. and revenue generation? I, mean, so I think early stage ventures, uh, a lot of times you'll find this one lane. You find this path and it works and it clicks and it's great, but odds are good you can't ride that one lane for forever. But the trick when you're a small venture is how do you pedal the bike on one lane while investigating the next lane and the next lane and the next lane? And how do you do that in a way that's sequenced appropriately? How do you do that in a way that's, um, that's not distracting or dilutive to your efforts? Um, one area of expertise that our mentors have is helping early stage ventures figure out how to take what they've learned selling, selling to one group of customers or through one, one channel or through one value prop and how do you begin to expand that so that you can enhance your revenue generating opportunities without killing your company? Early stage companies are super fragile. You're like, they're like, like naked four year olds kind of out just before dark, right? Like they were having a great day on the beach and now the sun's setting and you're like, oh my God, like you could die out there, right? So mostly <laughs> what good, good accelerators, and there, there are others here in Boston that I love. I'm a mass challenge mentor and judge and there's other places that do good things too. It's not just us. A lot of what what we do is make sure that you don't die out there. That's pretty much job number one. Most startups were born to die, and a good advisory team and a good startup accelerator will, will keep you from dying while also helping you grow up, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about, about um, the type of companies that you accept. Is, what is the criteria? Yeah. Is there any specific things you look for? There are specific things we look for. Um, so unlike, I, I think we are unique in that we work with companies that are already generating revenue, um, which makes for a lot of kind of sad trombone moments when I meet amazing companies with great ideas. But uh, the way our program is structured is it's really designed for companies that are already generating revenue. Uh, on the low end, companies come into our program between, you know, at $15,000 a month recurring revenue. At the high end, closer to 50 or 75. Quite a bit of flexibility there depending on where we see the growth potential. Uh, we look for teams with execution capability. So you, you, we're very mindful. I love the spirit of the solo founder, but I can tell you after 92 companies, it's a nearly impossible feat to get like out of that hole. So you have to show you can build a team. So we look for, you can be a solo founder on your cap table. You can be a solo founder in that you hold all the equity. But uh, we look for, for companies that have a team with some proven execution capability. Now that may only be three full-time people. It may only be two full-time people with a couple part-time people still working with early stage ventures. The other thing we look for are uh, companies that, um, have are not on the edge of a pivot. So if you might be selling something, but if you can, if you're already feeling like it's a, a kind of a, a dark alleyway that you don't, not sure you want to go down, um, that's another sign for us that maybe the timing isn't right. And this is because the way the program works. Remember that growth team that we were talking about? It is not good for you, the company, if you come into the program and you're not ready to take them on. If they can't deliver value because you're not totally sure how you want to grow, it's wasted capability. So we look for companies that don't know exactly which fire they want to pour gas on, but it's not an infinite number of fires, right? They haven't started 50 small fires and they're kind of not sure which one yet. Maybe they started 50 f small fires, but they've narrowed it down to three or four. And we can help them narrow that down further and then take that growth team, which I would think of as a big bucket of gasoline, and then we can pour them on that fire. And so, have there been any patterns, any particular uh, industries that are that are that are that have emerged, or is it all, all across yeah. the board? Across our, our portfolio in general is quite diverse. We're about 50-50 split, B to B, B to C. Um, the only thing we don't do, ironically, is life sciences companies. Um, that's I know, right? Uh, it may just be because of my own painful memories of my failed life sciences career. Um, but really, it's just there are some industries where the, the capital needs are just not aligned with an accelerator model. There aren't many life sciences accelerators in general. Um, also, things that are highly regulated. If your company's in a highly regulated environment, accelerators can be tough because you might be there for three months and poised to accept all this value, but you can't 
clear some regulatory hurdle and all it kind of like it just your shit falls apart. Um, so there are a few healthcare accelerators in the country that uh, we're we're tight with and they do it in a special way. Um, so yeah, highly regulated industries, life sciences, hardware companies are tough too. We've done a lot of hardware companies in our portfolio in the former model. Um, hardware is pretty capital intensive. Um, you've, it, the hardware companies that we look at now are past development stage and they're in the sales stage. So we're looking more at hardware companies that are um, that are out of development and into sales. Any specific background for the founders, like a business or engineering, or that doesn't really matter at all? No, I think, you know, I'm always mindful to not fall into a, a rut on pattern matching. You know, when you've done, so we, we've invested in 92 companies, but we've looked at 1,000 to invest in those 92. Um, I love early stage companies, so I see a lot of companies through programs like Mass Challenge. I uh, run a co-working space in Providence, and I work with a lot of early stage ventures there. And it can be very tempting to get into this mode of pattern matching where you know what you're looking for. And I think that's, um, that is both a, an asset when you're, you're doling out money, but it can also be a detriment because you, you can't see the forest for the trees. I think when we look at founders, um, what we're looking for is the right mix of, de of determination and grit, but with the ability to be open and to contemplate change. I know you guys know Dave Balter. He does this like sponge stone story where he talks about if you're too much of a stone, then you can't absorb anything. But if you're too much of a sponge, you get heavy and full and you can't move on. It's that dynamic tension between sponge and stone, right, that you look for in a founder. Uh, startups are awful. They're the worst thing, worst way you can spend your life, right? Um, they're brutal. They're high risk. You'll probably get divorced. It's really hard to have children. Um, the first time you lose someone else's money, it's heart wrenching. It's terrible. It's way worse than losing your own money. I'll tell you that from experience. Um, it's like a it's like a love story that never really gets to the like the sexy chapter. It's like all beginning and all end, and somehow the middle of the book got ripped out. Um, but if you're into it. Um, <laughs> And I am. <laughs> you can uh, really see a pathway towards changing the world. That is hard to do in the large enterprise format. You can. And it is in, in amazing to see a company achieve milestones, to deliver new value, to bring new products, to delight customers, to innovate in areas of high social impact. I mean, it's, it's really, really, really rewarding. Um, but it's definitely harder than getting a job in an established business. And so it's not for the faint of heart. And now on the investor side, it's, it's almost as still as hard being an investor in these companies. You're, you're really more than just a capital partner. You know, you're an, you know, we're operating partners in the business and I mean, we're, we're close with our founders and it, you feel their pain, right? And so it's, it's, it's just not for everybody. So you can kind of, when you meet a founder, it's hard to look at you and say, it's not for you, guy, right? Because I don't know, we haven't been there yet. Um, but I, do, I just think in general, it's hard. And the founders that survive are the ones that have the most, um, the, the ability to be open, uh, but not noodly, to accept resources without kind of getting dicked around, to be able to be candid and honest without showing all their cards, right? It, they're just people that can kind of find that balance point. Um, that said, there are all other kinds of founders that make it too. So there's, there's no one type. There's no one type. That was a long way of saying no, there's no one type. <laughs> but it's great. You talked about a, a tight relationship with, your, with, with the founders. Can you describe it a little bit? How involved are you in helping certain decision-making process? How much there's independence in certain areas? Where do you get more involved? Well, the stars we invest in ultimately have total autonomy over their business. Um, we give you the money and we don't tell you how to spend it. I have no legal way to tell you how to spend your money. Um, we don't take board seats. We don't take equity. I have no legal levers to operate in your business at all. Um, I think there's a trust relationship that you have when you work with early stage ventures, like whether you're a mentor, an advisor, or an investor. I think there's just a, a foundation of trust that you can feel early on or not feel early on. Um, we are uh, very active, particularly in the, during the accelerator experience. We meet with the companies uh, in person once a week, uh, sometimes more if that's the point uh, that they need. The team is very active. Um, then after the accelerator is over, there's this funny thing that happens where sometimes we actually meet more. Because if you're successful in the accelerator, the company after exiting the accelerator will have a lot of opportunity 
and they uh, will often still want to come back and and continue to benefit from our, our expertise and our advice. Our alumni network is also a huge asset, so rather than it always be me and my partner all the time trying to fill in your gaps, we might hook you up with a founder that's four years ahead of you that had that experience, and you might be able to find value that way. Our mentor network's very valuable. Uh, certainly, when you exit the accelerator, you don't our relationship doesn't evap evaporate uh, in any sense, uh, fiscally, legally, right, emotionally. So our alumni relationships are, are almost as important as the relationship during the accelerator. What we just do is it becomes more of a natural rhythmic interaction as opposed to a structured we talk for four hours a week no matter what kind of relationship. So maybe, maybe it's a good chance to... If you have an example of one or two companies that surprised you, how much they benefit, kind of, kind of a story with an example um, on how that turned out to be a success story, or yeah, I don't really like to speak for my founders. I mean, I can I can talk more about how I've been surprised by companies, but yeah. um, you'd have to ask our alumni about what value they got out of the experience. Uh, surprises, um, I think. There have been times when I have been truly, truly surprised by how much stick to itness a founder has demonstrated. There have been times when I have looked at a scenario and thought to myself, I'd quit. I'd bail. I'd be out. And the founder stuck with it and came out the other side. And it, those are very humbling moments. It is so easy to be me because I can come in and out of your business as I, as I choose. Now, I, I may lose money as an investor and I have to deal with those consequences, but psychologically, I have a space between your business and me that I, don't, I can control that. Where as a founder, you don't have that control. Like you're in your shit and you're in it every day and you swim in it and you dream about it and you sweat about it. And I, it's sometimes I can forget that I have that distance and I can be very, you can just get to a place where it seems so obvious what to do to you. And you have to remind yourself to walk a mile in that founder's shoes and remember how real it was for you when you were at the center of your business. And there have definitely been moments when I was just reminded that as much experience as I have, as competent as I know that I am, I am really good at what I do. There is a lot that I don't know. And life is full of surprises. And humans are mysterious <laughs> mysterious and they do mysterious things and if you lose your humility around that if you lose your love of that if you lose your touch for that then you probably shouldn't work with startups yeah and i i have lost it at times and had to come back to it um so y your model is not um focusing like you said in 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 a uh, Unicorn hunting, and, and you're not against the VC. So, what is the relationship with potential investors? What is your advice to companies uh, if, they, if they're be being approached for investment or they are seeking investment beyond? Uh, yeah, uh, raising money is, uh, is, a, is, is an important thing. If you're going to do it, you got to do it. So, uh, my advice to companies today is the same as it's been for a couple of years. The biggest thing I see founders do is they kind of raise money. There is no kind of, or with Yoda, there is no try, there is only do. If you are going to raise money, it is the only thing you are going to do. It is the only thing you are going to do. And if you are doing other things inside of your company besides raising money, you're not raising money. Straight up. Um, if, you're not, if you're not beating the streets, having many, many conversations every day, you're not raising money and you will fail. I think the other mistake that early stage founders make when raising money is they talk more about the tactical things that they will do with the money rather than help an investor understand the value that they will create and the inflection, the inflection points that they will attain. A lot of times early stage founders will sit down and say, well, if I can just raise $250,000, I'm going to hire six interns, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and it's going to be great. But then you ask the question, well, what, what will, will it allow you to achieve? What value will be created? What inflection point will you attain with that investment of capital? And oftentimes, early stage founders really don't understand that. And they don't understand what they're giving up in exchange for that. It's amazing how many early stage founders will give away 20, 30% of their company without really understanding why. And I think that that goes back to the, the, where we started about the narrative of fundraising and this myopic, approach, this myopic story that we have, that the only real startups that exist are the ones that go to try to raise money. And if you're not raising money, then you're not building a real startup. You're building a lifestyle business, like roll your eyes, like, right? And I think that you see a lot of founders today of all ages out raising money with air quotes around it. They don't know why, they don't know what they're doing with it, and they don't really know how. And I think if some of those founders just spent more time building their businesses, finding customers, and, and selling to those customers, they might actually just be happier. So, so a little bit back to what you were describing, what 
than startups in your program do with the money that you offer, which were those, those experiments. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? I, I understand that it might be very specific to the startups, but what are typical experiments or some that are relatively common? Yeah. Or? It really varies from company to company. So we have two Boston companies in our portfolio. One's B2B, one's B2C. Right? They focused on very different things during the accelerator, and they used their resources in very different ways. Um, I think... I think the cash is really not the, if, if you want to get into it, if you're looking at an accelerator, don't let cash be the primary thing that drives you. The cash is super nice. It never sucks to go to your Bank of America account and see $75,000 there on a Tuesday morning. It's cool. Like That's a good feeling. You're like, now we can do some stuff. But if you're actually going to participate in any of the top tier accelerators, the value you, are to, you can derive from those platforms are, is way beyond the cash. And you should be looking at, uh, are you expediting your path to, to market growth? Are you, are you building your team capability? Are you creating a network of advisors and mentors who are going to continue to help you build the business? Are you expanding your geography? Are you improving your articulation of your company story? Are you making an incredible uh, enhancement to your value prop? Everything except what money is in the bank. I think for rev up companies, because we are focused on revenue, there are kind of two flavors of that. For the B2B companies, a lot of times it's around sales pipeline, optimization, contracting. Uh, we had one company where they used to, they have an enterprise solution and they would let a customer try it uh, with only a portion of their employees, right, to try to get them on board and then sort of fight their way to getting wider adoption. They just stopped doing that. And they went in and they said, everyone, every, it goes to everybody, right? That's how it works. And it was transformative for them. Had a massive impact on their ability to get adoption, uptake. Um, so for them, a lot of our experiments were around how to do that and how to position the value prop. For our B2C companies, it might be digital marketing. It might be really how do you take what you know about your customers and use that in a highly strategic way to really uh, broaden your reach and touch your customers in new and exciting ways to help sell. So let's talk a little bit about relationship with academia. You've, you have Founders League as well with other universities, and can you talk a little bit about that and how that expands or extends with the connection with RevUp? Is there a direct connection? Um, there's a connection in that I'm the connection. So okay. uh, I really love my local community. My investment model is really narrow and I meet a lot of startups and founders that I can't accommodate in that model, but I like to have them around. So Beta Spring has a Providence office and we'd be really lonely if we were in a building all by ourselves. So we run a co-working space where we offer subsidized office space for other uh, startups to join us. And uh, we try to support that through uh, low touch programming, you know, focusing on recent grads and millennials and other ways to help a second tier city kind of connect itself to the regional ecosystem and get stronger. You, you mentioned the, uh, Rhode Island and Providence and um, the East Coast. We were just having a conversation earlier about the metaphor with the, the difference between the West Coast with Silicon Valley and this is between the East cities. East Coast, West Coast. <laughs> yep. So, so uh, can you talk a little bit about that experience, uh, b being in Rhode Island, but reaching out both to New York and Boston, a lot of the growth here in Boston with the RevUp. Uh, how is that different from the West Coast, or how is that different between the cities, or is it is it really not that different? Should we be thinking more regionally? Um, well, for there's a lot in that question. I'm not sure what the question is. Um, on the East Coast, West Coast thing, it's really overrated. Um, West Coast got some great stuff going on. East Coast got some great stuff going on, right? It's really about how do you like it? How do you like your tea with cream, you know, milk and sugar or no? Um, to, they're not competing on the same metrics and to think that there's a rivalry between Boston and San Francisco is dumb. Uh, I don't buy into it. Uh, I think that we as a country both add unique things to our world and I'm very, very, very blessed and lucky to live in a country that has those kinds of flavors. Like, awesome. Many countries actually don't have uh, two totally different styles of uh, startup ecosystem. Um, for me personally, uh, I spend most of my time in Boston, uh, but quite a bit of, you know, splitting my time between um, Boston, Providence, and New York. I love New England. I totally get it. Like, I get the Puritan thing. It makes tons of sense to me. I, I, lo I just love it. I get it. Like, I get it. I know how to work it. I, I, know, I know all the accents. Like, I'm from here. Um, I've spent some time on the West Coast. Uh, love it. I would move there, too. Super beautiful. Uh, New York is awesome. Uh, we, again, New England is so lucky to be at the epicenter of such an amazing corridor between Boston and New York. It's one of the most densely populated, if you actually stretch it out to DC, it is one of the most economically productive and densely populated uh, regions in the world. And what a, what a, what a blessing to be here. Um, so 
Uh, for me, I think about investment opportunities really fluidly. Um, I think that our job is to find the best startups and to help them grow. I like to be face-to-face -face with the companies we invest in, so I think there are limits to that. I'm only going to spend so much of my life on a plane. Uh, so I'm not doing a lot of investing in, like, Colorado right now, um, uh, although I might uh, in the future. So I, I think regionally... Probably the, this is not the question you asked, but I guess what I'll say on the whole East Coast thing is I think of New England as a region. Uh, for most of my life, I have lived uh, either in Boston or Providence, but in all of that time, been very active across the region. It takes me 45 minutes on my Amtrak train to go from my super affordable house in Providence to my super swank office in downtown Boston. Um, and I spent six years at MIT commuting back and forth. I just, I just think... It, Providence and Boston are closer together than San Francisco and Palo Alto, and they think of themselves as a connected valley. Like, Providence and Boston think of themselves as, like, estranged stepsisters <laughs> that, like, share an ancient mother that no one wants to talk about, right? So it's, um, I, I think I meet a lot of people on the train every day that just move a lot. It's a global phenomena. It, it, we no longer live in a world where you work where you live and you live where you work. There's so much fluidity. And so I think the whole uh, concept of, of geo-based investing is changing. Look at things like AngelList, AngelList syndicates. All kinds of things are changing now where uh, while there's still, I think geography still plays a role in investing. For example, if you're trying to raise money, it's very hard to do a bi-coastal fundraise unless you're a very special kind of organization. So certainly I don't want to say geography doesn't matter, but I don't think it matters for companies that are located between D.C. and Boston. I guess I was trying to go from the flavors you were talking about. That's part of the question. Uh, but uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, about um, um, seeing where you are now after it's been more than a year uh, with RevUp. We announced it a year ago. We've been right. investing for six months. So where do you see the immediate next steps in the future? Uh, what you've learned so far with that model? Yeah. What's happening? Are you growing? Yeah. So... Uh, by and large, the model works. There are a couple uh, changes that I'll share in the privacy of this room and the privacy of the internet video, which will be published <laughs> shortly thereafter. Um, in the old model, all we, we, did a, we worked in a cohort, a cohort model, as did most accelerators, where you would take 12 or 14 companies and they would all come into the program at the same time and they would all exit at the same time. Uh, and there was actually quite a bit of efficiency in that model because a lot of ventures uh, have the same problems, maybe slightly different nuances to them or you might have different solution sets, but a lot of similar problems and there was a lot of efficiency in having a cohort model. In this model, because we're working with companies that um, are really focused on revenue generation, on growth, uh, we, we're, it's much more customized and we no longer use a cohort model. So we invest on a rolling basis. I call it cohort-ish, where we try to get groups of companies to start around the same time. Uh, so with that, we gave up a lot of efficiency on the delivery of accelerator services. So all that really means is quite literally for my partner and I, more individual meetings as opposed to group meetings. So uh, in thinking about how this scales, whether we want to expand to further geographies or add partners, um, there's just a difference than if you have a, uh, the accelerators that have a cohort model. That's probably been my own personal realization is that this model is more high touch and requires more time to execute on to the degree of fidelity that I want to execute on. Um, so but we got our first check. Oh. <laughs> yeah, which as, a, as, an, as an investor, an early stage investor in, in these early stage companies is crazy. You never get a check. You just wait and you wait and you wait. Um, there's an investor here in Boston who's in like 89 deals and he's getting old. And if you ask him, he'll look at his watch in his old wizened way and say, I just hope I live enough to see an exit. Um, <laughs> because exits are taking in longer and longer. They really are. They're, they used to say four years, then they said five years. Now they say seven. Now they're saying nine. I think if you're honest, most of these companies just aren't going to exit at all. Um, so we're all kind of waiting for Godot, you know, for these exits to come. Um, and so with our model, one cool, like, reality is that I, I got a check, right, that I could show to my investors and be like, hey, like, that company paid us some money back. Um, that's cool, right? Now, the trade-off is that because we don't have ex equity, this one company is doing really, really well, and they may turn into a unicorn. Um, I have traded... I have traded a stake in that company. So I've, tr I've traded the opportunity for an outsized return uh, to, to collect a smaller return, um, a more predictable return. So that, I think, is a different flavor to the model. So we, we had other conversation with previous speakers as, uh, and, and how young the industry really is, how still 
disaggregated. Every 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 sort of uh, mentor in the individual industry has to be aggregated in different groups. Accelerators do an, uh, 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 an enormous job in that. So the question is, where do you see the innovation in the accelerators model? Opportunities for that. What do you see big changes happening? You're, you're, pro you're proposing one, which is uh, going to maturity, but I think um, some of the conversations that we've had in the past is that it's such a nascent industry still, yeah. other pieces are moving. Do you see other areas where it might not be what Revable wants to do, but um, that seem potential ways to innovate, what, how to support startups? Yeah, I mean, we changed our model because we felt that it was a, it's an innovate or die kind of model. I, there are so many accelerators, they have a trade association. <laughs> yeah, I'm not like they have a membership dues driven trade association um, run by some really great people who were motivated by some really uh, authentic goals to try to help newer newer accelerators <laughs> learn from the older accelerators. Um, I think I had a, a kind of shocking experience about a year and a half ago at one of these meetings where I sat down at a table with a with a really super cool person who was going to open up an accelerator um, in I can't remember if it was Oklahoma or someplace else, and they were going to use the same exact model that we used in 2009. And I think in any industry today, it is really hard to use a five-year-old model um, and apply it uh, faithfully without contemplating um, how 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 that model might need to evolve. I mean, I'm a business model innovation kind of nut by training. I was a you know, systems biologist. Like, I, it just, it's going to be hard to have the same model forever. And I think what we'll see is um, there'll be a lot of accelerators that will die. They'll just run out of money. They'll, have it, they'll spend their fund, and they won't get any return, and they'll die. I think you'll see some uh, more philanthropic uh, accelerators continue to emerge, like the Mass Challenge model, uh, where there's no, ex there's no expectation for a return. It's a community return. And I think you'll continue to see those kinds of programs do well, and they'll be funded without the expectation that the startups pay it back. Um, they'll be funded through philanthropy. Um, then I think you'll we'll continue to see activity on the top tier accelerators that are equity driven. Um, I don't think 500 startups or Y Combinator is planning to stop anytime soon, nor should they. Um, so I, I think it's think about it, like kind of going back to where we started. Imagine like we were like the eighth or ninth accelerator in the world in 2009, and by 2014 there were like 250 other organizations that called themselves accelerators. Imagine being in any industry where in that period of time you went from being one of eight to being one of 250. Right? If you were in any industry, if you, made a, if you made a gadget, if you made a piece of software, you would feel tremendous pressure to contemplate the impact of that and to be thinking about how you would innovate. Um, I mean, I know my, you all know my bias. I think this myopic focus on a single path of source of funding for startups is a mistake. I think it's a recipe for disaster, and I think we're doing an incredible injustice to a generation of entrepreneurs to fill their head with the notion that the only way to build a successful company is to raise successive rounds of venture. It is, it is not only untrue and not supported by the data, go to any other place except this window and look around, and I guarantee there won't be a single building filled with a venture-funded startup. Right? There are only a few places on planet Earth where you can see that and be confused and think that's the way that it has to be. This is not to say that certain entrepreneurs shouldn't go on a venture path. I meet venture-fundable companies all the time, but I think we've done a tremendous disservice creating a single-threaded narrative, and I think it's especially bad for non-traditional entrepreneurs who don't fit the model of uh, high-tech, unicorn, mostly dudes, mostly coming out of three or four cities in the country. So I think that that for me is the next, for me, that's the innovation I care most about. And you just gave me the perfect segue. I uh, did, I said there were dudes. <laughs> I, I now I know where this is going. Uh, uh, I can feel it. Yes. Um, Awkward. Okay, I'm ready. No, and, and it's also because um, globally for Startup Grind, this is a, a month that is celebrating human entrepreneurship. Awesome. And uh, uh, I, I guess I was curious to find, well, I was doing some reading, um, and I was aware of this a couple of months ago. Uh, last year, the city of Boston started Women Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship Boston, right? Which is an organization that tries yes. to we boss, right? Right, we boss, and try to bridge a lot of the inequities that are have been reported in many ways about uh, lack of opportunities. I want to talk to you, ask you about your personal experience yeah. uh, seeing um, so many startups and. Um, what has been your experience? What is your opinion on that on that subject? All right. First, the caveat that it's a mistake for any singular perspective to be mistaken as a uh, global voice for all women entrepreneurs. I do not speak for all women entrepreneurs. Uh, having said that, uh, I, now I'm going to. Um, so I'll just say, having worked in life sciences and politics, I will tell you that entrepreneurship feels like paradise. 
Uh, those are two incredibly misogynistic industries where I experience things that I wouldn't even want to talk about on camera because I might cry. Um, I think, though, um, there are a lot of exciting things happening where the dialogue around diversity and entrepreneurship is getting more authentic. Uh, people are getting less afraid to take it straight on and open have an open conversation uh, and not just be scared by it. So that's really good. Um, I just went to a, a participate in an event last week or the week before that was focused on women and entrepreneurship. And here was the thing that made me mental. So a lot of these programs are trying to bring women into the system that men are in, which doesn't work for most men. So a lot of these programs are designed around helping women raise venture funding which most men can't do. So in some ways, my frustration with that is, you know that this is, a, this is I would call this statistic-like, but at broad strokes, a high school football player has a better chance for playing for the National Football League than an entrepreneur does getting venture funded for their startup. That's how few venture deals happen every year. Okay? Just put your head around that for a minute. Doesn't mean you don't raise seed funding, angel funding, friends and family money, right? But venture dollars. So what I'm seeing in a lot of these women entrepreneurial programs is a lot of really amazing people, well-meaning people, trying to help women get better at raising venture dollars. But we kind of already know that doesn't work for lots of entrepreneurs. So just saying we're going to drive more women here and more VCs are going to talk to more women and we're going to have more women mentors that are going to help you make better decks and help you raise more money and we're going to have uh, funding uh, organizations that are going to be more open to women, to me doesn't feel like a complete solution. It feels like a way to create a false sense of equity. So I'm really interested in thinking about how we can use these alternative fundraising paths, these alternative uh, ways of venture building to bring more diverse entrepreneurs into the fold, rather than let's claim victory by saying we're just getting more women having meetings with VCs. Because I don't think in the end that's going to produce a demonstrable outcome where suddenly we're going to see more women-led ventures. Because we're not seeing more men-led ventures either that way. So it just feels a little bit like a, a little bit of a fallacy there. So that said, I think that opening up the VC conversation to women and being honest and realistic about why is it that so few women, you know, why is it that like whatever less than 10% of all the VC deals in the country go to women, like why is that? I think that's really important. But on a ground level, you're, whether you're a man or a woman, you're probably not going to get venture funding. So just somehow, somehow saying that as a woman we're going to help you raise venture money, eh, this doesn't feel right to me. So you said it doesn't sound like a complete solution. Do you think education is part of it? I mean, we're seeing it in oh, science well, sure. and STEM and all if that. If you want to get to the whole, like, why are there fewer women at that, at that place, it's really a pipeline. It's a whole pipeline thing. I mean, and it, I, we, I'm not really an expert on this, and, and I, there are many people who can speak more articulate, articulately about it, but there, there are all kinds of grooming things that go into making a fundable entrepreneur that you have to do throughout an entrepreneur's life cycle. Um, and as we learn to do that better, more equally for, for young men and young women, we will see changes downstream from that. And I think there's a lot of really important efforts around uh, teaching core skills that the business world val values and making sure we teach them equally to boys and girls. Um, again, I'm not an expert on that. I work with young people and I like to be a part of that. But um, yeah, I just, I don't bring a lot of special expertise to that part of the party. So with that, I would like to uh, open it to the floor and get some opportunity to, to, for the audience to ask some questions. So, Thank you, Melissa. I think you could start a startup stand-up comic routine, <laughs> right? Yeah. Can I be like the Louis C.K. of startups? <laughs> yeah. That'd be cool. That well, was you. so great. And, and your comments about the women and, and getting VC, wonderful. Let's talk, do you mind talking about valuation? I know it's not part of your rev up world, but a lot of people really don't know how to put a thumb on the valuation of their business. And, or they tend to have this rose, I don't know, skewed, what is it? Yeah, I guess I, I, would, I would just ask, I would ask a venture, why are you bothering to think about it? Why? And if your answer is because I'm raising money, then I would then ask you, why are you raising money, right? And we'd go through a subsequent stage of questions. And if we arrived at a place that fundraising seemed like a worthy use of your time, and I thought that that was going to work and we were going to help you do that, um, then we would have a conversation about how other comparables are being valued in your industry. Are you East Coast, West Coast? Are you B2B? Are you B2C? You know, what does your traction look like? I mean, valuation, and I'm not an expert at all on that, is 
totally fabricated. It's a made up language. It's like currency. Like it's like currency. Currency isn't a real thing, right? What's currency today? It's the Bitcoin of the startup world, right? Like, what is it? Like, we made it up as we went. Um, certainly, valuations spiraled out of control over the last you know, 10 years, and exits added a zero at the end, right? Where suddenly you didn't have to be a $10 million business to have an exit. You had to have a $100 million business to have an exit, right? And that was certainly driven in large part by outsized valuations. Um, I think oftentimes when I meet most companies that are worried about it, they don't have any reason to be worried about it because no one cares what you say your valuation is because no one's going to invest in you anyway. Um, <laughs> angel, like angel investors are different. They're looking at they're looking at it differently. Like they're looking at it differently than institutional investors. And of course, you have to have a valuation if you're going to give away equity because how you make that formula has a huge impact. But I think just in general, of the let's say I have. 10 meetings a day, valuation matters in less than 1% of those meetings. I just think that was really important for you to say because I see valuation, cap table, spreadsheets yeah, that are gorgeous. I, and I'm like, eh. It's kind of a red herring when you talk to an early stage venture that's over-focused on it um, as opposed to being more focused on helping me <coughs> understand the operational aspects of their business. Um, because again, valuation is fluid. And a lot of it is about storytelling. So a lot of your evaluation is tied not just to what I would say are kind of quantitative metrics about your business, but about qualitative metrics about your business. And if you spend any time dealing with qualitative metrics, then you understand that there's a lot of flexibility in the outcomes of that. So if a company is over-focused, they almost always are younger founders who grew up drinking the Kool-Aid, and they think they need to do that because that's the right thing to do to take a step forward and be be recognized as credible. Yeah. Um, but typically, it's probably not what's going to kill them, and it's probably not what's going to come next for the company. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this is not a question, but more of just a compliment to your business model. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur who has always looked at the existing platforms for um, accelerators. And the biggest thing that has kept me away from going to any of these is the equity stake that they take. And so I think that your model of a revenue component of, of these businesses is um, going to draw a lot of high quality entrepreneurs to your platform um, that may have never wanted to give up an actual equity stake in their business. And so just compliments to you for um, creating probably a really good magnet for bringing really good entrepreneurs to the table that you guys will get to. That. Well, thanks. Uh, I think what's important is uh, you want to have a spectrum, right? And you want to have a lot of complementary things that can stitch together. Um, I think the focus on equity and giving away equity for a lot of early stage ventures is a, not unlike valuation. So uh, I have a company in my portfolio that's having this mortal crisis about giving away equity to bring in a new CTO. And right now the company's pretty fragile, but awesome. And I said to the founder, I said, okay, so you don't want to give away another 10% of your company. And I'm like, what's 10% of nothing going to be worth to you in three years? Right. Yeah. What's, what's, you know, you still retain a lot of equity in your company. What's, you know, what's your 80% or 70% of a $10 million business going to be worth to you in three years, right? So thinking about that is an important part. Um, I do appreciate there are founders that build businesses that they actually want to run. They don't want to flip the business. They're not trying to get out. They're not immediately obsessed with exiting the company and selling it to someone else. One of our biggest success stories in our portfolio was a company that received some good venture capital. They were acquired by a Boston-based company, and within like a hot second, most of the founding team evaporated. Right? And acquisition is kind of ugly for a lot of companies. You get acquired, a, 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 let's say you are, you got a 15-person company or a 20-person company, and you're jamming, and you're loving it, and you've got customers and it's going great and you work 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 and then you get acquired you become like a piece of like a speck of dust in someone else's closet right when that company absorbs you they often make you move or they have, and many times you're you are you are relegated to parts of someone else's organization that are not fun anymore not exciting you lose your ability to be an active operator in a company that's that can be great if you want that. And for some people, it's perfect. I mean, I've had companies where I've worked with for a short period of time and I've been out, it's been great. But there are other times when you actually kind of want to run your company for a while. And thinking about retaining your, your equity in that company uh, long-term is an important consideration for some founders. I think 
my, my life experience now has just been that there are all different kinds of founders and there are all different kinds of companies and there are many different paths to success, but we seem to only talk about a really narrow subset of them. I love them all. I am like path agnostic, but I just think it's been a, I think it's been a disservice to only talk about that one narrow path, right? And, and it made you feel left out, like you were not into it. And I think that's a really good example that if we can open the dialogue, we may actually get more creative um, about how we help new companies grow. You guys are so polite. You're like passing each other the microphone. You're like complimenting me. Yeah, it is a pretty, this is a pretty nice group of people. Well, I was going to ask a nice question. Now I feel like not. Yeah. Uh, rough it up a little bit. Er, it so yeah. as soon as you mentioned that like growth experimentation team, I just got this amazing image of these people in lab coats doing crazy <laughs> experiments. And I was like, I want them. Those, that's amazing. For people who obviously are not part of, of the accelerator, can you give us like, two or three driving principles for the, our own growth experiments that we might sure. want to be running? Yeah. Um, yes. I'll do my best. Uh, so. Uh, the third partner in RevUp um, is, uh, is an amazing guy. He was one of the co-founders of a company called Teespring. And one of the things he brings to the table is this sort of reminder that uh, there is no substitute for data-driven experimentation in your company. And it is really, really easy to get caught up in the anecdotal kind of emotive personal sides of your business because usually you start companies where you either you kind of care about your customer or you care about some component of the value <coughs> exchange and it can become really disorienting and you're, um, you can become very biased about what's happening. And I think when you're experimenting with growth, there are probably two ways to think about that. The first is uh, you have to actually design a real experiment. It's not an experiment if it just goes on forever and you kind of try it and you kind of don't and you don't measure it. Um, that's not growth experimenting, right? That's just doing shit. That's just paddling, like you're just floundering around. And I think it, it's, it, it is very advantageous for a team to bring some of the almost just scientific inquiry and the methods of scientific inquiry into that. Um, and then really having the courage to look at data. Um, we had a company that we just invested in um, a, a few weeks ago, and we did this. There's this tool called Hotjar where you can, you know, it's like free, and you actually, it heat maps your site, and you can see how people move around your site. And it is a really beautiful site. And we looked at it, and it turns out that 75% that of all the traffic to his site was bouncing, and the first 25% of the site, and all the good stuff was below it, right? And you have to be able to look at that and let go of your assumptions about what you thought your customers wanted. And they thought that their customers wanted this image and this call to action, and they felt really good about it, and they were making sales. And then when they started to bring data to that, it was, it required a lot of courage, a lot of fortitude, like, like a strong sense of self to be able to look at that and be like, I was totally wrong about everything, right? And then to begin to rebuild. So I think you have to have, you have, to have the courage to look at real data and you have to have the discipline to build real experiments. And I think that's where having exper experience working in science can be very helpful. So using the scientific method in your technology startup or any kind of startup, I think, can yield incredible outcomes. Thank you. You, just, you can just stand here and ask me the question, yeah. I guess I'll just ask. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, so you've worked with a lot of different companies, and I guess I was just curious to hear, you know, if your broad experience, what are some of the biggest um, growing pains or you know, similar challenges that you've seen a lot of startups go through? Um, yeah, there's a couple. So on the, I think, interpersonal side, um, that founder relationship, those early team members, requires a lot of love and a lot of nurturing and a lot of, a lot of advice on how to get through the hard times. Um, it is like a marriage, uh, but like a bad marriage, like a desperate housewives marriage, right? Where you can't believe the things that are happening to you are happening to you. Um, and I think um, it is very hard when you are a small organization because you can't amortize that anywhere. There's no closets to stuff it. It's just you and you and you and you. And there's not a lot of places to hide all your baggage. And you've got to be really good about getting stuff up and out and open. And I've seen, I've seen several of my most beloved early stage ventures fall apart because the, the team just really just failed at that, like they just, it just didn't work. Um, I think not, not getting your customer right uh, early on, like get, not getting to customer acquisition early is a problem. Um, it, is, it is hard down the line to talk about like, you know, build a lot of stuff and then like if you build it, they will come. Like nothing worse than watching a company spend a lot of time building, but have a, a sort of 
I won't say dishonest, but having a, a delusional sense of customer discovery and thinking they know what their customer wants, spending a lot of time building and then releasing it to the sound of crickets. Like that just hurts. Like that just like you get like goose pimples. You're like, oh, I'm so sorry, man. Like I think uh, really uh, reading the cliff notes on customer discovery. Uh, I've seen a lot of early stage ventures talk the talk about lean startup and customer discovery, but never even watched like Steve Blank's videos, right? Like they just never even took the time. Like if you don't have the time to take Steve Blank's Udacity course, like you're in trouble, right? And I think a lot, it's really tempting to read the cliff notes. I do it sometimes, I'll start talking and then I'm like, you don't know shit about that, like shut up. Like, because it's easy, because the narrative's out there, like Google is out there so you can get just good enough. So I think really glossing over real, cus real customer discovery um, you ask people about like who their competitors are, and they always name five companies, but they never acknowledge that human behavior is your biggest competition, right? Human like human laziness is your biggest competition. So a lot of that um, are mistakes that you can really avoid. They just they do require a kind of authentic constitution where you really want to put your back into it. So and that's on the early end. Those are more for younger founders kind of coming into it. Uh, I think those are pretty common mistakes. We've all made them. I've kind of gone on for a long time. It would be a. I can't watch the page watch the <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't be upset if you guys wanted to call it quits. No. <laughs> well, if there are no more questions, thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Nice to have you.